I love that Marta is so accommodating there. <laughs> Forgot to put my, my speaky thing on. Good morning. This is the unofficial. You'll get the official greeting in a moment, but I wanted to uh, welcome you all here uh, and welcome our guests. The Musettes will be uh, sharing with us in a moment, and we are so grateful that you are here today. Uh, it's just a blessing to, to worship with you, and we're just grateful for it. So they'll, they'll come up in a moment. That'll... Uh, yeah, it's going to be good. I'm excited about it. Um, so, uh, yes, I remember what it is. Uh, we do have uh, some, you're going to help us out with this, I hope. We have to sing happy birthday today. Um, because it is Sue Daniel's birthday today. And uh, it, it happens every once in a while. And, and sometimes I ask people whether they would like to have it or not. And Sue didn't get a choice on that <laughs> as our outgoing board chair and all the service that she's done for so long for this congregation. We are so grateful for it. So we do want to wish her a happy birthday by singing happy birthday to her. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sue. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> and thank you for helping us out with that. Uh, there are events. Check your bulletin. Check the newsletter. Those are all there. Uh, we encourage you to look at those things. But we are here to worship. So I'll invite Myron Ford to begin our time. Okay, the official, good morning. Thank you for braving the elements and thank you for making it here. Schmitz, you came as far as we did, right? That's a half hour drive. Um, you were hoping we'd get off the side roads real quick because it was a little, a little bit, but it was a challenge and I appreciate all that made that effort. You look wonderful. It's great to see you here. This morning, um, I'd like to give you a little um, thought maybe for this Advent season. Um, it's been wonderful uh, being up at camp and seeing the snow and not so wonderful um, coming back and saying, well, we got another couple of weeks, couple of weeks. We started saying we're gonna move in, in uh, before Halloween. And then, then we're gonna move in before Thanksgiving. Now, they said Christmas. Now, hopefully we have a great New Year. <laughs> Enough. We are so blessed. And I appreciate giving us a pass <laughs> on that. Josh Billings, an American humorist, is quoted as saying, Life can be a grindstone. And, a, and whether it grinds you down or polishes and sharpens you really depends on the stuff you're made of and the attitude you have. Today, may you be polished and blessed by your going in and out today with us. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Today's scripture is Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. Isaiah 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and a fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. We, he will not judge on what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears from his ears. But with righteousness, he, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteous will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will lay with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling all together and the little child will lead them. A cow will feed with the bear, and the young will lie down together, 
when the lion will eat the straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy in all of my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people. The nation will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. I hope you are blessed by the reading of his word.
Wow. Wonderful goosebumps from that. Mark said, are you excited? The musettes are here. <laughs> he said, we had, uh, what, several, several years, all through the 80s, that Margaret and Sandra and Marianne Blickenstaff all recruited us to sing with the musettes. Great fun. <laughs> I am blessed. This morning, as you're starting to think of giving and what it means this season, it's so easy to do it now. It should be all the time. But it is wonderful to be blessed and to share those blessings. Know that what you give is totally what you get. Understand that in your forgiving this morning. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Thank you for giving us so many things, so many blessings. Among them, we want to thank you for giving us the abilities to choose, choose our attitudes, choose our giving, choose our sharing of our service time. May you bless these gifts and all that have given to further your kingdom and bless each other. Amen. Good morning, everyone. If you guys would all stand with me and sing, we're going to start with Go Tell It on the Mountain. The lyrics are all projected. Shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks 
And now we are in, on 199, the first Noel. Take a moment, and I'm going to treat you all as representative of your group there, and I want to ask us to join in prayer on a blessing for the Musettes, if you would bow with me. Lord, we are grateful that you have given us this gift of music this morning, and we pray that you would keep the Musettes close in this Christmas season, protect their voices, protect them as they travel, and we ask that you would bless your message as it goes out. We're just thankful for them. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew's Gospel, the third chapter. I know it's Christmas and we should be in the second chapter, but we're going to go ahead just a bit and look at that 
third chapter for our text this morning. Beginning in the first verse. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, and they confessed their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance." Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Back in October, I was gone for a little while. I went over to Oregon for a seminar And the group of people in my class, our cohort is what they call it, the cohort, they were coming in from all over the United States, and since I was driving over, I said that I would go ahead and and pick up my peer group, the smaller group, uh, at the airport in Portland. Now, I've been to Oregon quite a bit. I've traveled around a little bit there quite a few times, and so I know a little bit about getting around, and I've had trouble in Portland every time. Those of you who are laughing have been to Portland. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We watched a short little documentary the other day about the roads in Portland and how they all were, were built and, and torn down and rerouted and all this stuff. There's dead ends and stub freeway exits and stuff hanging in midair all over the place. There's roads there that take you east when you want to go west and roads that will take you north when you want to go south. And it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. You just have to trust, though, that you're on the right road and continue following it until you eventually get to where you need to go, even if it doesn't look like you're on the right road. It's got the rivers there, the Columbia, the Willamette. They cut through the city, and there's all these highways that turn into surface streets, and there's a lot of different ways to get turned around. So I was being careful. I was paying very close attention. I got to the airport, and that's pretty easy coming from the west. You get off 84, and you take the 205 north to the airport, the airport way, and then you're there. And so I picked up my colleagues, and we got back into the, into the car and we got on the road. Now, I've been working with these folks for about a year and a half online, but this was the first time I had a chance to meet them in person. So we got to talking, sharing our stories and visiting and doing all those things that you do when you should be paying attention to the road. So I'm on the road, and and I knew where I kind of needed to go. I'd spent a little extra time memorizing it so that it would look like I knew what I was doing. You take the 205 south, and you get back on the 84, and you take that west, and that hooks into the I-5, and you take the I-5 to the 405, which will take you across the river, and eventually you'll get to 26, which takes you out to the coast. Perfect sense, right? Yeah. Well, it was the second time that I passed that bridge, when I started to realize that I didn't really know where I was going anymore. So I got my head back in the game, and I got off what I thought was the right exit, and and we started traveling down this surface street. I knew it was going to maybe get me to where I needed to go, and I'm driving down this road going south, and they're like, not sure I trust John anymore. (laughs) So they're back Googling on their Google Maps, and they say, "Uh, you're going the wrong direction. And as it turned out, yes... I was going the wrong direction. Life is a journey. We're born, 
We travel through on this road until we reach our destination. If you've been on Highway 95 that travels south out of Idaho into Oregon and then to McDermott and on to Winnemucca, that road, uh, there's not much choice there. You get on that road and you're on that road and there's no other road to be on really. It's just miles of high desert sagebrush on either side and you just go. No turns, no worrying about whether you're in the right place or getting lost. Just set the cruise and settle in and go. Other times our life journey is like Portland. A tangled up mess of choices. Some seem to go in the right direction even though they don't. And others, you know, you know beyond a doubt they're not right, but it turns out to be the exact right way. We need to go right to get left. We need to go north to get south. It's easy to get tangled up and miss your off-ramp, but if we want to make it to our destination, then we need to be on the right road. Obviously, we're not talking about going through Portland, Oregon, or traveling in the Nevada desert here. This is a spiritual journey that we're talking about But on this spiritual journey, not getting turned around and getting lost, it's even more important. We pay a lot of attention to achieving what we want in our physical life. A lot of folks have whole detailed plans about where they're going to go and what they're going to do. Go to the right school, get the right job, live in the right neighborhood, retire from, from your work at the right, with the right amount of money in the bank at the right age. It's all planned out. It's all mapped out. And they're not going to let anything get in the way, and they're not going to get lost. But these people sometimes, they wander aimlessly all over the place in their spiritual life. In Luke 16, Jesus tells a parable about somebody like this, a rich man who had his whole material life mapped out in front of him in detail. He dressed in fine clothes, and he ate the best food, and it looked like his journey was blessed. But when he died, he reaches his destination and he found that he'd been lost all along. Instead of rest and peace, this rich man ends up in Hades, the text tells us, tormented and in agony. The point of the parable that Jesus tells is that you got to get it right while you can. You only have a limited time to do this. You have to find your way spiritually before your journey comes to an end which is why Jesus was all about us going in the right way. If you need to stop, if you need to stop and turn around, then you better do it. Continuing on down the wrong road only leads to disaster. At Christmas time, we do like to get into the stories of Jesus' birth. That's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? It's what we're celebrating. And it's easy to get caught up in that part of the story. That miraculous stuff, you know, the angels and the choirs and the, 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 the beautiful promises. It's all very inspirational. And it's easy traveling. It's a road that we've been on a bunch of times. Every year we return to it. The angel comes to Mary, promises that this child that she'll bear will be holy. That's a familiar trail. Joseph taking the family to, to, to Bethlehem for the census. That's familiar. We all know where it's going. We all know the road. We're not going to get lost. But that's only a small part of the story of Jesus. In fact, two of the Gospels, two of the four, don't even have anything about Jesus' early life in him. You get that? Half of the material that we have about the life of Jesus doesn't deal with his early life, his birth. Because the focus of the gospel message isn't really on his birth. It's about the life of Jesus. It's about the teaching of Jesus. It's about the work of Jesus, both in his word and in his deed. It's ultimately about the redemption that Jesus makes possible. Yes, Jesus has to be born in order for us to get there. We can't get to that part of the journey without going through Christmas. But it's important that we don't get stuck in Christmas either. That's like making loops around the neighborhood watching the Christmas lights and getting lost in the cul-de-sacs and you can't get out. You just keep going around and around and around enjoying Christmas when you really need to be on the road. 
So if we're going to stay on the right road in our spiritual journey, then we're going to travel. We're going to move forward. And one of the first characters that we encounter when we travel this road is John the Baptist, early in the gospel stories. There's a lot about John the Baptist. We could do a whole series of sermons about John the Baptist. He's a, just an incredible, incredible character in the story, more than we can cover in one day, in one Advent message. He's clearly connected to Advent. He's clearly connected to this time. His own birth is woven in there together with Jesus's. But just like Jesus, the birth of John the Baptist, as miraculous as that was, it's not the central focus. It's his work. It's what he said, what he came to do. And what John came to do was to get people ready for Jesus. And for people who were going the wrong way, he had a message. He needed to preach repentance. I know, that's a tough word. It's a difficult one sometimes for us to get our heads around. We maybe need to take a look at that uh, that word is right there in the second verse of the scripture we read this morning. Repent. Now in the Greek, this is metanoia. You've probably heard that before. Metanoia means to turn around and go in the other direction. Don't go the way you were going. Turn around and go the way that you should be going. I think we need to kind of think about that for a moment. Because in English, in our understanding of repentance, we've kind of cut it up a little bit and focused on some things that are right at the beginning, like Jesus' birth, that, that aren't about, that's not the whole story. In English, the repentance carries this weight of regret, of remorse. We feel bad, and so we repent. Or we think people should feel bad, and we ask them to repent. This is what it is about. It's about feeling bad. It's about guilt. And I think that that's accurate to a certain extent. If you're going the wrong way physically, if you're on the wrong road physically, like I was in Portland, then you're going to feel bad about that. I know I did. You feel bad about going the wrong way, trying to get somewhere in, and headed in the wrong direction. You're going to feel bad about how it affects other people, which it will. My colleagues in the car, they didn't have a choice. They were along for the ride. I was taking them in the wrong direction. So feeling bad, regret, remorse, that is part of it. It's where we start, but it's not the central part. We don't want to start and end there. You can see this in the passage that we saw from Matthew 3. A lot of people coming out to John, a lot of people wanted to hear this message, and they're feeling bad. They have that remorse. John baptizes them in the, in the Jordan River, and they're confessing their sins, acknowledging that they were headed in the wrong direction. But you know this as well as I do. Knowing that you're going the wrong way is not the same thing as going the right way. Right? This is true. Knowing you're going the wrong way is not enough. It is critical. It's a critical first step for sure, but it's not enough. How many of you have been around a person like this that's somebody that knew they were doing the wrong thing, but just kept on doing it. Kept on doing it. They maybe even felt bad about it. Boy, I sure don't like what I'm doing here. Here, I'm going to go do it again. They just keep doing it. It doesn't make sense, I know. That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. But we, we've known people like this. Folks who keep going back to the dog that bites them over and over. Maybe we've been that person once in a while. So recognizing that we're there, recognizing we're on the wrong road, that's important. Confessing that, that's an important step. But I could have easily said to my colleagues in the car, yeah, I feel bad about the fact that we're going the wrong direction and just kept on driving. Wouldn't have made much sense. But this is what we do sometimes. Sometimes. So repentance can't begin and end. It can't stop at this idea of feeling bad and, say, and acknowledging and confessing. John gets at this. He gets at this in verse 8 of this text. He says that, that people need to do something. They need to bear fruit worthy of repentance. You actually have to change what you're doing if you're really going to be repentant. 
This is why metanoia, that Greek word, fits so well. It doesn't mean just recognizing. It doesn't mean just acknowledging. It doesn't mean just feeling bad. It says turn and go in a different direction, the right direction. And that's exactly what John is talking about. Not just recognizing that you're on the wrong road. Not just acknowledging it. Not just feeling bad about it. No, you actually have to turn around and go the right way. Because the consequences of staying on the wrong road are pretty severe. You heard it in the text. I mean, again, it's not a great Christmas text. Because you want to have a good time at Christmas. This doesn't sound great. The axe is at the root of the tree. The Messiah has a winnowing fork in his hand. He's going to store away the grain, but burn up that chaff. So getting on the right road, it's important. I said that John the Baptist is woven into the Advent story, and that's true. But the work of John the Baptist is also woven together with the work of Jesus. They run parallel. They're, they're one and the same, really. John says he's baptizing with water for repentance. And that Jesus will come and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire, probably for the same purpose, repentance. You see, because Jesus is just as concerned about metanoia, about turning around and heading in the right direction as John the Baptist was. In fact, if you just flip over one page into that chapter 4, and you'll see here that, that Jesus has the same message that John does. The first words, after he goes out into the desert, and he's, he's, he's tempted by the devil, he overcomes that, and he enters into his ministry, and what does it say? He comes bearing the message, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Almost the same words that John uses. Here's what both John the Baptist and Jesus are after. It's clear to them that people are traveling the wrong way. They're not going in the right direction. Their priorities are wrong. Their actions are wrong. They're doing the wrong things. Their hearts are in the wrong place. They're on the wrong road. They're lost. And so John the Baptist and Jesus, they both come with the same message. Stop going that way. Don't continue down that road. Turn around and go the right way. Now John begins it with this water baptism and Jesus completes it with his sacrifice on the cross. But the message is the same. Go the right way. Repentance, that's just our response. Jesus says, this is the direction you need to go. And we would say, well, I'm not going that way. Maybe I should. We turn and we go that direction. We see that we're, we're headed the wrong way. We feel bad about it. That's where it starts. But we have to do more. We, we have to pull off the road that we're traveling on into the parking lot and turn around and go the correct direction. Make a U-turn. We've got to get those wheels rolling towards this destination, the right destination. That's what it means to bear fruit worthy of repentance. This idea of repentance, it starts in our hearts. It's in our heads. We recognize it. We feel it. But it ends up in our hands, in our feet, in our doing the right thing. Going the right way, it means going the right way. So this spiritual journey, it shows up in our physical world, in our actions, in our behaviors, in our fruit. It's important that you be on the right road. I pray for that. It's important that I be on the right road. I pray for that too. That's why I have so much trouble when I drive through Portland. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to doing it like we do here in Idaho. You need to go west, you, you, you head west. You need to go south, you head south. You, do, you go in the direction that you need to travel. But sometimes you have to go one way before you can go another. Portland is like that. The road that you need to be on, it may take you away from where you think you need to go initially. 
But it is the right road, I'll assure you. This is the road that you need to be on no matter how much it feels like the wrong one. That's faith. Believing that Jesus has placed you on the right road, pointed you in the right direction, and said, this is where you need to travel. That's faith. We have to have a certain amount of faith when it comes to following the road that Jesus puts us on because it don't seem like the right road. This road, it doesn't, doesn't look like it ought to be the one that leads to glory because it's a road of sacrifice sometimes. It's a road of suffering sometimes. It's a road of servanthood, the road of the least and the last. It's the road to the cross. But it does take us in the right direction. It takes us where we need to go. It takes us to the only destination that could matter. And so we have to believe. We have to have this faith in order for us to even repent, to even consider turning around and heading in the right direction. The message of Christmas, it is the message of Jesus. And the message of Jesus is all about getting us going in the right direction. To get where Jesus wants us to go, we need to be on the right road. And if we're honest, often we are not. Often we are headed in the wrong direction. We're lost. We're turned around. And we need to recognize that. That's the first step. That's really important for us too. You won't even start to head in the right direction if you don't think you're going in the wrong direction. But knowing that you're on the wrong road is not enough. It's not even enough to feel bad about it. We actually have to turn around. We have to turn around and then go in the right direction. We have to repent in the way that the Bible talks about. Metanoia, turning and going. And this Christmas, I want to invite you, listen to the voice of Jesus beyond the, the cooing of the baby in the manger. That's beautiful, yes. And we can enjoy that and celebrate that. But listen to more than that. I invite you to hear the voice of the forerunner. John the Baptist, who proclaimed this message, who told people to turn around because the kingdom of God is near. Get going in the right direction. And then hear Jesus when he says exactly the same thing. Get on the right road. Head in the right direction. Because going the right way is the only way that we'll get where we want to go. Let's pray. Lord God, we do get lost. We get confused. We take a road that seems right, but it turns out to be wrong. Once in a while, you will convict us and you will convince us that we need to turn around. Lord, help us to go beyond recognizing we're going in the wrong direction and actually turn and head where you want us to go. Help us to faithfully follow you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. This message about repentance is probably appropriate considering we're going to share in communion here in a moment. Because we do want to be ready for it. We in the Church of the Brethren, we practice, for those that are visiting with us today, we practice believer's communion, which means that if you have a relationship with Jesus, then you are welcome at this table. We let that be between you and God. And so we invite all who have that faith to, to join us in this. We'll pass the, the elements out one at a time. We'll read together. We'll pray together. And then we will take either the bread or the cup together. Uh, but we do invite all to enter into this time with a clear heart. And so we'll bow for a time of silent reflection, of prayer, and, and we're going to especially invite you to consider whether or not you're on the right road. There's no better time than right now to think about that and perhaps turn and go in the right direction. So I invite you to join me in this time of silent reflection and prayer.
Lord, it is good to be on this journey with you. Because as we travel with you, you draw us together with each other. Lord, we have reflected quietly on our relationship with you and with our sisters and brothers. We've prepared our hearts. We've been nudged back by your spirit into that right way. And so we are ready. We thank you for this invitation to this table. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You'll find the order on the back of your bulletins. It began in this way. On the night that he was handed over, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You would pray this prayer with me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us even unto death. Send your spirit upon us so that we may know that all who eat and drink at your table in our congregation and around the world are one body, one holy people. May we be inspired and equipped by this holy meal. The bread of life, Jesus' body, broken for you. Shall we take it together? After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Thank you. 
join me again. Lord, give us clean hearts, forgiving hearts, praising hearts. As we drink this, we join with our brothers and sisters in heaven and on earth, giving thanks to you in an endless song of praise. May this cup remind us of your ever-flowing love. Amen. The blood of Christ was shed for you. Shall we take it together? And if you would join me in this final prayer. We have come to your table, Lord, and in taking the bread and the cup, we have received a special gift. In remembering, we have come close to you, and we have tasted your infinite love. May your spirit transform us from within so that we can see with Jesus' eyes, hear with Jesus' ears, speak with Jesus' mouth, feel the world as Jesus feels, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Lead us into the world, nourished by the bread of life. We pray in the name of the one who gave body and blood, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would all stand with me once more as we close today with Go Tell It on the Mountain, just the course. want to remind you that uh, the Musettes will be performing on Friday and Saturday, Friday at 7 o'clock here and Saturday at 2 o'clock. And uh, if you want more of that, then come and, and be blessed, if you would bow with me. Lord, we are, will go tell. You have given us a great gift, and we will be faithful with it. Uh, you love us, and you call us to love others. So we ask that you would go with us from this place as we enter into the world. We ask that you would give us courage and strength to share that love. And we pray that you would bring us back together so that we can praise and worship you. We thank you for this season, the reminder of the gifts that you give us. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.